Yeah, look at the person beside you, your wife or your, your husband right now, and say, you always in your feelings. <laughs> right? Yeah. Is this thing, is it on? We good? We good out there? Yeah, we on good. Hey, I'll tell you what, I, I want to be honest with you. Out of all the messages that I share throughout the year, I believe that today is one that the devil does not want you to hear. I believe that today some people are going to get some freedom. And listen, I don't have a whole bunch of jokes or nothing like that, but I believe that, that God wants us uh, to, to hear this message today. So I'm just going to jump right in and we're going to get started. So hopefully you got your shoes on. All right, here we go. Rejoice in the Lord always. When are we supposed to rejoice? Always. I will say again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. By the way, let me just say this, because somebody in here is going to leave and they're going to go, that preacher didn't have his Bible up there. I, I, I typed this stuff out, all right? So it's on an iPad. Anyway, y'all probably didn't need to know that. I just want to let you know. So, all right, so somebody, somebody's going to complain. He didn't have his Bible. It's all up here. I've memorized the whole thing. Anyway, so... <laughs> That was a lie. God forgive me. Okay, so don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, in prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts, your minds in Christ Jesus. Today, based on that scripture, I want to talk to you about this subject, from crappy to happy, from crappy to happy. Some of you need to look at your spouse and go, you always crappy. Don't, don't. Don't do that. <laughs> so I want to ask you all this. Have you ever had plans, but your plans kind of turned to disaster, whether it was a vacation or, you know, whatever. So you had things just planned out. Now, I know that I'm a person of order. I've got to have things planned out. But every once in a while, I've got things planned out. They're going the right way. And then something just smacks me in the face and smacks me back into reality. Matter of fact, Mike Tyson said everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the face. I want to be the guy that has the plan for if I get punched in the face, right? That's what I want to do. So with that being said, the way that I want to set this up, I want to talk about my wife's golden croissants. How many of y'all eat croissants? Is that right? Is it crescents? Crescents? It's croissants. All right. So every week on Tuesday and Thursday, Monday, we're, Sunday, we're here at church. Uh, Monday, we're at church. Wednesday, we're at church. Every day of the week, we're at church. But on Tuesdays and on Thursdays, I love leaving work and actually going home because my wife cooks on those two days of the week. I mean, and it's awesome. So every week, she'll cook something like I'll walk in and I'll smell mm, bacon and eggs. We're having breakfast for supper, which, by the way, is freaking awesome all the time. Yeah. So I'll be like, oh, we're having so good. But last Last week, I walked in and was like, something's burning. Like something, like I ran up the steps. And if you ever walk into a room and everybody's in the room, but they're all kind of looking like, we know what's going on, but we're not talking about what's going on. My wife had made these croissants and they were burnt. I've got, I have a picture on my phone and I told her, I was like, I ain't even going to put that up there because I'm talking, they were, they were burnt. Like the thing that my wife makes all the time that tastes so good, that look just like this, golden and flaky. And then you bite into it and you got the cheese, which I don't even eat cheese. She says there's cheese in there, but, but me, and it's just so delicious. I was like, oh my gosh, this thing that can bring me joy to my life. You all almost burnt our house down making them. <laughs> I could tell that Jenny was kind of frustrated. I can kind of tell because as I walked up and smelled this stuff burnt, I kind of looked around and it, I don't really, how can I explain it? They weren't really golden brown. I would say dark, like not dark, not black as sin, but they were pretty dang dark and, and everybody's looking around and, and nobody's yet. I'm like, well, dang it, I'm hungry. So I went anyway and I grabbed that thing and you go, I guess the best way to explain it, it looked like a science project gone wrong. And I was like, I'm going to tempt this, but I bit into it and I was like, that was disgusting. So I took a knife and I scraped off the black crusty part and up under it was, was this fluffiness, this meat that was just done to perfection. And I looked around and within 15 minutes, every single one of her black as sin croissants were totally gone. They were all off of, all off of the little tray that was in the table. I was like, oh my gosh, I wanted some more. Have you ever had something like that happen in your life? The reason why I bring that up is because in your life and in my life, things get burned. Things go the wrong way. Plan doesn't happen the way that you want it. But reality is events happen to us, but we've got to learn to respond correctly. And that's what guides us into our future. That's the way that we've got to do it. It brings me up to this point of two guys that experienced the same thing, walked with Jesus, had this awesome relationship with Christ, Peter and Judas. When I think about them, they, they experienced so much of the same things, but they 
interpreted them totally different. When I think about this, listen, Peter and Judas were both there when Jesus took the, the loaves and the fishes and fed 5,000. Like They were there. They both witnessed that. They both saw that. It was totally amazing. They were there. Both of them were there when Jesus healed the blind man. Y'all remember Jesus spit in the mud and wiped it on the blind man's face and everybody was like, ooh, disgusting. That's so offensive. You shouldn't do that. And the blind man's like, I can see. Put it all over my whole body. Like They were there whenever that happened. They were both there when Jesus turned the water into wine. Don't you know that was a party? Matter of fact, Jesus and the disciples all show up to this party and the party's turning down and they're like, what's up? And they go, man, hey, we ran out of wine and Jesus is like, turn down for what? Let's go. Let's get this party rocking. And Jesus turned the water into wine in Canaan. We see that in John 1 and 2. Listen, the thing is, I believe that Peter and Judas, they both experienced the same things and they both made two crazy mistakes but they both reacted to those things differently. Judas sold out Jesus with a kiss for 30 pieces of silver. And what's crazy to me, and I shared this with the band this morning, do you know the last thing that Jesus said to Peter? He called him friend. Judas walks into the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's about to kiss Jesus on the cheek to show that Jesus is the one. And Jesus looks at him and says, Judas, hey, go ahead and do what you've come here to do, friend. The last words that Judas heard Jesus say to him, he called him friend. We find out that Peter, whenever we look at him, Jesus said, listen, you're going to deny me three times before the rooster crows. And Peter's like, I won't do it. And Jesus goes, yes, you will. Peter goes, you don't know me. I won't do it. I'll be with you till the very end, till death do us part. And Jesus is like, this is not a marriage ceremony. And Peter, I know you. I created you. I made you. You will do it. And we find out that Peter actually did it. Matter of fact, Peter did it to the point to where he denied Jesus to a little girl. A little girl. So we find out that Judas betrayed Jesus because he got paid. Peter betrayed Jesus because he was afraid. Both of these men that had walked with Jesus, they both failed, but their reactions were totally different. There's some people in this room right now that you're in a season and an event has happened. Something has happened. Maybe you failed. Maybe you have fallen on your face. Can I tell you this? Failure is not formative. You've got to use that failure and allow it to build a success in you. It's part of the process. Failure is a part of the journey. We've got to get that in our heart. Your failures matter as much as your success. Everybody in this room fails. I'm so sick of the church. The church, if somebody falls on their face, what do we do? We shoot them. They're in the army of God and we're shooting our own army. Why? Because they failed. Can I tell you this? Failure is not a person. It's not a person. It's an event that happened. I'm not going to look at you and I'm not going to condemn and castrate you because you fell on your face. Can I tell you this just to let you know every single success that this church experiences is built on a failure. We've tried it and we've fallen on our face and then we got back up and then we tried it, fell on our face and then we got back up and all of a sudden we tried it and it worked and we're like, holy crap, but we had to fail in order to succeed. For me, all my successes or all my failures, you know what my failures is like another peg in the ladder so I can go higher. And that's what I want to get that to you today. I want to make sure that you understand that in your life because Jesus is trying to give us joy. Listen, joy is not just in the success, but the joy is actually in trying. And we got to do that. I love this where he says the righteous man falls seven times but rises again. Failure is part of your story. You're not a failure just because you failed. You want me to tell you when you become a failure, when you become freaking lazy and decide you're not going to get back up. You got to get back up and you got to fight like hell for your life. You got to fight like hell for your marriage. You got to fight like hell for your kids. You have got to fight the fight, but you got to get back up. And it's not always going to be somebody there to pick you up. Somebody's not going to be standing outside of the ring and watch you fall and jump in. You may have to be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Listen, they had to get up on their own. Mama wasn't there. Daddy wasn't there. The pastor wasn't there. They couldn't call the preacher or text him and say, hey, what do I do in this situation? Sometimes you got to fight for yourself, but it takes me back. And I just want to let you know that the right reaction and the wrong reaction, you've got a choice that you've got to make. you got a choice that you got to make today. Peter and Judas, man, we find out. Judas, he reacted in a way to where he took his own life and committed suicide. He chose a permanent solution to a temporary problem. 
But then we find out that Peter, Peter chose to go back to the disciples to get involved in community, and he started repenting, and he started finding healing with his friends. And then Peter, the cussing disciple, the one that cussed out a little girl, the one that, that betrayed Jesus. Listen, the Bible says that Jesus looked at him and said, you are Peter, and upon this rock I'll build my church. Hey, the one that screwed up on your failure, I'm going to use you. And we find out that Peter becomes the leader of the church. And I don't mean just like name on a wall with a plaque. I'm talking about the leader. 3,000 people got saved. And then I love it where Peter said this. He said, listen, when I get stressed, I'll just cast your anxieties, cast all your cares on him. Why do I need to cast my cares on Jesus? Because he cares for you. He's caring for you. You go, Dwayne, you just don't understand. What if I cast my cares on God and he lets me go? He won't let you go because he cares for you. He's careful with your life. He's careful with your dreams. He's careful with your future. And listen, I get it, man. Life has let us down. People have been careless with us. So we think God's going to be careless with us. But that's not who he is. He's the perfect father. So with that being said today, I want to talk about building some good habits. If you want to be happy in your life, if you want to be successful, if you want to be able to get back up from your failures, you've got to create some good habits. The definition of a habit is an acquired behavior pattern, regularly followed until it becomes almost involuntary. In other words, you get to a point into your, into where you have something that is pre-programmed. Adam always talks about when we were in high school and he was wrestling and how he would always get in trouble. Believe it or not, Adam getting in trouble. But he would get in trouble so the coach would say, hey, practice your single leg takedowns. He would be over there and he would be practicing this single leg takedown over and over and over. And guess what? Every time that I watched Adam wrestle, as soon as the referee would blow the whistle, Adam would jump in for a single leg takedown and you would say, Adam, why are you doing that? He would say, it's just in me. It's ingrained. That's what we've got to do. Our habits have to be ingrained in us. You got to practice the right thing over and over and over. God, I pray that right now that you would remove every distraction so that we can get this today. God, I believe that the devil does not want us to hear this, to understand this, and to apply this to our life. But today, God, we have some hurting people in this place. And God, they need to get this word. This is a revelation into their life, God. So I pray that right now that you would touch us. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, y'all ready? Here we go. Seven points if you want to be happy in your life. Number one, three walks. Everybody say three walks. Three walks. All you've got to do is three different times a week, I want you to go out and I want you just to take a five-minute walk. How easy is that? Some of you are stuck in your house or you're stuck in a cubicle or you're stuck in a truck driving. I'm saying park it, turn it around. Hey, get outside and for five minutes, take a walk. I can't even tell you how many God ideas, creative ideas that I've had, not when I was shoving my face in the Bible, but when I got out of this building and I just walked around for five minutes. Amen. So I want to challenge you to take a short walk. Take a short walk. I believe that there's a connection and a correlation with us just getting outside, just taking a short walk. The Bible says that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. A lot of times when preachers use this first, they talk about sexual immorality or drugs and alcohol. I believe that this right here would be too, this is, this is something that we need to apply to our lives. I think that we need to do it with drugs and alcohol and sex and all that, but we need to apply it somewhere else. You go, Dwayne, I want to be happy. I want to get my happiness up. Why don't you get outside and won't get your heart rate up? There's something to be said about our physical bodies. I believe that might be the next slide. Let's see. Yep. Get your physical body under control and watch as your mental health begins to shift. I promise you, if you do these things, now listen, you're fixing to take some pictures. At the very end of this, I'll go back and I'll have, the, I'll have all seven of these on. So number one, take three walks. How about a 20-minute replay? This is something that me and my wife have started doing. We just sit down at night and I look at her and I go, how was your day? Turn the TV off, pause Netflix, don't be scrolling on your phone, but actually pay attention and spend 20 minutes just looking at the person that you love and reflecting about their day and your day. Take 20 minutes every single day. You go, Dwayne, I don't have 20 minutes. Bull crap. Yes, you do. You got time to watch the ball game. You got time to surf social media. You got time to go hunting. You got time to put in overtime at work. You got 20 minutes in your day to do a replay. 
They took some people that were over 95 years old and they started asking them questions. What would you do more in your life if you had it to do over again? And they all said, we would do a replay. In other words, we would reflect, we would stop, we would get silent, we would listen. And here's the problem. Whenever we don't take time to reflect, in our minds, we start maximizing the bad things and minimizing the good. But if we'll sit back and we'll do a replay in our mind, we can start talking about the good things that God's really done for us. How about this? What if we do random acts of kindness? Is that not an awesome thing? I love being the recipient of a random act of kindness. I was eating the other day, and I got ready to pay for my food, and they said, Dwayne, it's already done. First of all, it freaked me out because I didn't know how she knew my name, but she did. And she goes, hey, so-and-so, somebody's already paid for it. And I was like, who? And they're like, uh, and I said, are they still here? <laughs> like, yeah, like, right? And I'm going, are they, are they here? You know, are they here? Was it an angel? I started thinking maybe it was an angel. It was definitely an angel that paid for my food. I'm like, dang, I would have ordered more, right? So, <laughs> but you know what I found out? It's always more blessed to give than to receive. It is so cool to, to be the recipient of a random act of kindness, but it is so much better when actually you're the initiator of a random act of kindness. And what this is, there's just something about me giving and serving and leading and loving and with no expectation of return, uh, no, no expectation of being thanked. Man, it's just such a blessing, just a random act of kindness. You go, Wayne, I can't do anything. Listen, something is always better than nothing. Just start small. Start small. Start small. Whew, that's good stuff, man. By the way, just to let you know, Paul, and I don't have this up there, but Paul said that it's because of God's kindness that brings repentance to men. God can be showing his kindness through you to somebody. How about this? A complete unplug, all you TikTok people. All you Facebook, Instagram I'll be trying at night to be going, Jenny, we had not kissed all day, and she's over there scrolling on Instagram. I'm like, baby, put the phone down. Daddy's here. <laughs> and then she's got my phone, and she's scrolling on both of them. I'm like, what the heck? <laughs> yeah. Everybody, the funny thing is, I'll say something like that. Y'all look at Jenny for a response. She's like, it's true. So... <laughs> You want me to tell you why you're so engulfed in social media? Because you live with a FOMO mentality, fear of missing out. I'm going to miss out on something, so what I want to do, whoo, baby, I just went ahead. I don't know what I did. There we go, fear of missing out. Fear of missing out. Sorry, I'm letting you in on the message already. Don't do that. Don't, don't go ahead. We all have this fear of missing out. What if I miss something? Listen, I challenge our church starting today after the service. A seven day. I would hold up my fingers, but I don't have but six and a half. <laughs> Thank you. A seven day fast. Thank you. A seven day fast from social media. You think you could do it? I'm talking about seven days. <laughs> Blake this morning's like, I'll just get a sanction and they'll take my phone. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> Do whatever, listen, do whatever it takes to get completely unplugged. Matter of fact, why don't you, why don't you stop, uh, worry about missing out? Why don't you get unplugged and plan your next vacation? Some of y'all are like, oh my gosh, dang, I love our church. What did you learn at church this week? I, I need to plan a vacation. <laughs> Your, your vacation shouldn't come by default. It should be on purpose, with a purpose, and for a purpose for you to relax and for you to enjoy it. So why not plan a vacation? Right after that is workflow. That's another number five, workflow. There's something about whenever you get lost in your work, something about letting go and getting totally, totally consumed. You want me to tell you why I put workflow on here? Because purpose comes to people that are at work. Purpose comes to people that are at work. If you're going, Dwayne, I want to be used by God. I want God to speak to me. Are you working? Because we go and we see the story of Elijah whenever God told Elijah, hey, your successor that's even going to have double the anointing of you, Elisha, I want you to go and anoint him. And Elisha wasn't sitting under a tree. Elisha was out in the field being proactive and working. God's not speaking to some of y'all and you don't have happiness in your life because you're freaking lazy. Whew, didn't give any amens on that. Amen. 
You got to be praying. You got to work. When Jesus found Peter, Andrew, James, and John, they were on a boat. They were working. They weren't being lazy. They were being proactive. There's something about it. I'll get in my office on a Tuesday and a Thursday. Thursday's really my sermon day where I'm typing like crazy, and I'll have eight hours in my office, and I'll be typing, and I'll have jazz music. Now it's Christmas music, but on the TV, and maybe that's not your workflow and what you do, and you go, Dwayne, don't you feel exhausted after you type for eight hours, and you're in God's Word, and you're just, no, I walk out of this church with my chest bowed out and happy because I was productive with what the time that God gave me. And it makes me happy. It makes me joyful. Man, it makes me so happy. Number six. Everybody say number six. six. Two-minute meditations. Two-minute meditations. A couple of times a day if you get stressed, let's try this. It's uncomfortable, isn't it? I've started doing this to where in the day I'll just go and I'll, I'll take two minutes. I, I put it on my watch a couple of times, and then sometimes I'll just I'll stop and I go, one, two, breathe in and out. During this two-minute meditation, I don't try to clear my mind because the Bible says that an empty mind, hey, listen, we all know an empty mind is the devil's playground, right? So I don't want to just empty my mind, but I want to take two minutes and I want to focus on the good things. What I found out is I can focus on things that God wants me to focus on. Focus on his promises. Focus on the good things of God. That's what we need to do because the Bible says those who delight in the law of the Lord and who meditates on his law day and night, talking about his word and his promises, that person is like a tree planted by streams of water which yields its fruit in season. So if you meditate... God promises you you're going to yield fruit. Dwayne, I haven't had the opportunity to pray with anybody for them to receive Christ. You're not in his word. Dwayne, I haven't had the opportunity to go out and share my faith. Then you're not in his word because if you're in his word, his word is going to direct you to be proactive and then you're going to see fruit. But only when you get proactive. Everybody say number seven. Five gratitudes. I got this from Cody. But every single morning, I've got three guys that the first text on my phone is a gratitude, something they're thankful for. That is so good. Do you know at the end of your week, I'll say on Friday or Saturday, just get a piece of paper and write five things that you're grateful for. Five, five things. You go, Dwayne, why would I do that? It will increase your happiness in your life. It's hard for you to be grateful for things and not sense the presence of God in your life. I can promise you that. And whatever you magnify in your life gets bigger. Yeah. So if you're not magnifying the things that you're grateful for, what are you magnifying? Uh -huh. So then I've got somebody that's going, Dwayne, so what's the point of your message? What do I need to do? Listen, you might need to go to the doctor. You might need some medication. You might need to find a support group or a small group. Now, with all of that being said, before I finish this message, somebody's going to leave here and they're going to say, well, I found seventh... Dwayne never even got to the Bible. He read some scripture, but he... What in the world? I don't go to a church where it's just all happy and fun and go lucky. This sounds like a prosperity church to me. No, it just amazes me that everything that I just shared with you is scientifically proven. But the funny thing is, science is finally catching up with God's Word. You say, Dwayne, what are you talking about? Well, if I can get this thing to work, there we go. That right there is what you, take a picture of that before I go on. Go ahead, take a picture of it. Three walks, 20-minute replay, random acts of kindness, a complete unplug, workflow, two-minute meditations, five gratitudes. You want to be happy in your life? You do these things, and I promise it will extend and increase your happiness. But whenever I'm reading scripture, Paul's talking about, he goes, listen, because I think that's, a, that's the world's prescription for happiness. But then Paul gives us a prescription. Paul says this. Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. It's like Paul's preaching. You know, whenever I get to preaching, I'll be like, God is good. And then it's like such a good thing, I got to repeat it. Paul's like, rejoice in the Lord always. Dang it, that's so good. I'll say it again. Rejoice always. Rejoice in the Lord is what he's telling us. So he, he's sitting there and he's preaching. Rejoice. In other words, he's telling us that happiness is a feeling. It's an emotion. It comes and it goes. But God's got something bigger than happiness. God's got something better than happiness. He's got this thing called joy. And joy is not about an emotion. It's not about a feeling. It's not something that comes and goes. You can have joy in all your circumstances and all your situations. You've got to choose joy. How do I get joy? You rejoice always. 
Rejoice always. You want to be, you want to be happy? Do the things the world says. You want to have joy which transcends anything that happiness could ever even touch? Then you've got to do what the Bible says and God's word says for us to rejoice. I love what David said. David says, enter his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. You can't do either one of those being quiet. You got to be loud. Both of those things cause you to celebrate. So let's just try this. He says for us to rejoice always. He says the right reaction, the right reaction is for us to always rejoice. So when you get promoted at work, what should you do? Whenever you get married, after all those years of waiting, what should you do? When God blesses you with a baby that you thought you couldn't have, what should you do? When the doctor comes in and says, that cancer that we said was going to kill you, it is gone in Jesus' name. What do you do? You've got, oh my God, y'all don't even know how to freaking rejoice. I'm going to tell you again, you've got to rejoice. The Bible says that we're supposed to always rejoice. And he doesn't say sometimes. He says all the time. So whenever you don't have money for your mortgage and you think that the bank's going to come and get your house, what are you supposed to do? Whenever you're going to lose your car because you can't pay for it, what are you supposed to do? Whenever the doctor comes in and says, listen, we thought that you were pregnant, but instead it's a tumor. What are we supposed to do? Rejoice. Always rejoice. You got to program that into your life. If you don't program it into your life and make it a habit, I can promise you, the devil will steal your joy. Amen. And God says that he's always going to, listen, I'm always going to give God praise. Peter said, rejoice in the Lord always. And then he said this, he said, don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request. He says, rejoice. And after you rejoice, then offer thanksgiving. God, this is what I need. God, this is what I'm going through. God, this is what I'm feeling. God, my depression is overtaking me. God, I get worried about this. God, I'm bringing it to you. But then here comes the promise. He says that if you'll come to him with petitions and with thanksgiving, it says, and the peace of of God, the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. I absolutely love this. He says, if I'll rejoice and come before God with thanksgiving, he'll give me peace. Do you know what peace is? Peace is something that is outside of our control, outside of our circumstance, and the very fact that we need the peace of God lets me know that this life is chaotic and screwed up, and it's going to go bad. Amen. Going back to the croissants. At the beginning of the message, I was talking about how burnt they were. Do you realize that the very fact that we even talked about those croissants is because they got burnt and they failed and they were jacked up? If they would have been good croissants, we would have just ate them and never mentioned them again. The very fact that God wants to bring some stuff up into your mind and into your head is because he loves you. When life gets turbulent and chaotic, he's going to be there. Listen, when peace comes upon your life, you've got to decide, I'm going to worship myself happy. I'm going to worship myself happy. Dwayne, you don't know my under, you don't understand my situation. You don't know what I'm going through. This thing's crazy. It's big. I've been to the doctor for months and months and months, and things just ain't right, and I've prayed, and I've seen people. The Bible says that if we'll come before God with thanksgiving and praise, that he'll give us a peace that transcends our understanding. What does transcend mean? I'm glad y'all asked. It means rising or extending notably above or beyond ordinary limits. To overpass exceedingly, exceed and outdo or exceed in excellence. Meaning your problem, listen, your problem might not make any sense. Your pain may not make any sense. Your circumstance may be illogical. The challenge may be too great for you. But we serve a God that promises peace. That transcends everything that we can understand. Peace that transcends all of our understanding. And then he says this. He says, I want to give you two pivotal things. If you will rejoice always, if you'll pray, if you'll shout with thanksgiving, if you will do this, I'm going to give you a peace that transcends all your understanding. Why would you do that, God? Because I want to guard two things on you. I want to guard your hearts, and I want to guard your minds. That's what God's telling us, because whatever is in our heart is going to overflow out of us. In other words, listen, I can't afford to be bitter anymore. I can't afford to have unforgiveness or hurt or to live offended. I can't afford that because I've got peace in my life that transcends all that crap. I don't need bitterness coming out of me. I don't need hate and remorse and resentment coming out of me. 
So I got to pre-program my brain and go, God, I know you're going to get me through this somehow. Guard your heart and guard your mind. What he's telling us is he's going to guard our heart and what's in our head. This peace that he gives us transcends all understanding. Every single thing that we can ever go through. But this peace has a name. And his name is Jesus. And it's only in Jesus and through Jesus and with Jesus and because of Jesus that we can have peace. That's the only reason that we can. So today I come with some good news. Some good news that somebody in this room needs to hear and you need to claim and you need to latch hold on. Jesus is still the healer. If there's somebody in this room and you need healing, he's still the healer. Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Jesus that took the loaves and the fishes and broke them and yeah. fed up 5,000 people is still healing people. The yeah. Jesus that spoke yeah. in, into the mud and he slapped it on us is still healing people. The Jesus that turned the water into wine is still healing people. Yeah. The Jesus that made the deaf here and the lame walk, he's still healing people and he'll heal you today. Yeah. Wow. Dwayne, what does that mean? It means I serve a God that can heal mental illness. I serve a God that can heal whatever is going on in your mind. I serve a God that can heal and transcend that depression that you're going through, that anxiety and that frustration and that tension and that remorse and that guilt and shame that you feel. Jesus can heal it all, but you got to give it to him. The greatest way to experience true happiness and the true joy is to give it to him. I had my series planned. I was telling Scott, I just met him. I was like, man, I already had everything planned, and God just changed it. And I think the reason why is because there's people in this church. We have a different kind of church here. And I, I don't want to wear that as a badge of honor. Like, I, I didn't set out when we planted this church to try to make it different. <laughs> like, Lord, give me some normal people. He goes, Yeah. <laughs> Just one, just one normal person. You got it. And then Deb showed up, and I was like, Lord. <laughs> <laughs> but I know this. I got just two minutes. I got to work out and do more cardio. Y'all killing me. <laughs> we serve a good God. And everybody in here, maybe you're going, Dwayne, well, the last two messages, I don't struggle with anxiety and depression. But you know somebody that does. Maybe your kid. One of the hardest things in the world is to watch your kids go through it. I would much rather feel the weight of the world on my shoulders than to watch one of my kids go through it. To watch somebody that I love go through it. So maybe you're not struggling and you're good, but maybe God put you here for the past two weeks so that um, you can preach these truths into somebody else's life. Because the word preach just means to proclaim the good news. Next week, we'll start and we'll have our Christmas series, and it's awesome. The message next week, don't miss it. It's awesome. But today, we have people in here that you keep struggling because you keep putting all your fears and your anxieties, your worries, your frustrations, and your stresses ahead of God. You got to create some good habits in your life. A habit that I'm trying to create is praying with my wife every day. Not just praying for my wife, but praying with my wife, like holding her hand, even when I'm mad at her, or I know she's mad at me, praying with her. That's hard. Matter of fact, there's been a couple of days last week where I just wasn't feeling it, and I just left, and I was like, I prayed for you even though I didn't pray with you. I got to create a good habit. That's being transparent and honest. We got to create habits in our mind. You know, it is, it is routine for us to get up in the morning, to go pee, come back, pick up our phones, and scroll, see who sent us a text. If that's a habit, why can't your habit be to get in God's Word for the first 10 minutes? Amen. You want me to tell you which dog in your life wins? The one you feed the most. Dwayne, I can't get over anxiety. Well, stop feeding it. 
And it's more, it's more than just praying about it. I know for me, Brandy, when I worry about something and I pray about it, guess what happens? I worry more because it's on my mind. So what I have to do is, Drew, I have to start to rejoice always, always in the good times and the bad times. If I can learn to rejoice, then my default reaction, are y'all catching this? My default reaction when something's bad's happened, people are going to look at me and go, Dwayne, how can you be happy whenever you're going through hell? And I go, oh, it ain't happy, it's joy. Because happiness is an emotion, it comes and goes. But I just got something inside of me that keeps, it can't help but bubble up. If I put joy in me all the time, then it's going to be coming out. I want to end with this story. And then I'm going to pray for us. It's about a little boy. And he had just got saved. He had just accepted Christ as a Savior. And he went home, and he looked at his dad, and he's like, Dad, I got saved today. And his dad's like, that is awesome. Son, it's, it's just so great that you got saved. And the little boy said, Daddy, I got a question. How big is Jesus? Like, how big is he? And his dad said, I don't know. He's probably the average size of an average man, probably around six foot tall. You know, just he was a man. He was a carpenter. He's probably six foot tall and probably about, probably Drew's size. He's a big old boy, you know, and he can handle his own. And this little boy got to thinking. He said, but daddy, today when I got saved, they said that Jesus came to live inside of me. Daddy... I, I'm just a little kid. I'm like four foot tall, and if Jesus is six foot tall, he must be sticking out all over. <laughs> Can I tell you, in your life, if you got Jesus inside of you, he's going to be sticking out all over. Yeah. Heads bowed and eyes closed. I know God's already moved, man. I just given y'all this as an uh, addition, but I don't ever want to end the service without giving the opportunity for somebody to accept Christ. If you've never been saved and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, and today something was said or done that made you think, man, I need Jesus in my life. Hey, I want to make Jesus my Savior. I want Him to forgive me of my sins, and I've never done that, so today I want to do that. I don't have Him sticking out all over because He's never been inside of me, so... If that's you, and you want to ask Jesus to be your Savior today, will you raise your hand? I think we all got work to do. I don't see any hands raised, so I'm going to assume, assume that you're where you need to be with God. This church can be a lighthouse in the community and a beacon of hope for people, especially as we go into this Christmas season. But we got to let Jesus stick out all over. Let me pray for us. Jesus, thank you for today. Thank you for this church, for this, for this message, for these people. God, as we go into this season of Christmas and we just finished Thanksgiving, thank you so much for Thanksgiving. But God, I pray that now that you would start speaking to our lives and our hearts. Help us to pre-program, to pre-wire praise into our hearts so that whenever we come up with that tough situation, we come upon it that we would still be able to rejoice always, even in the midst of the struggle and the battle. In the midst of going to the family get-together that we don't really want to go to, help us to be able to rejoice. We ain't happy about it, but we can have joy because your joy and your peace transcends anything that we can understand. God, help us to rejoice always. Thank you for today. Thank you for this church. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Thank y'all for letting me be your pastor. I appreciate it. I love my church. Let's all stand. Let's